Welcome back to the Nature Journal Educators Forum. Um, my name is Ivea Moore, and with me I have... Hi everyone, it's Keely Jo, uh, and I'm excited to be here today as well. This is a really fun um, topic today. And we've got Kate joining us as well. So Kate, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kate Ryder. Um, yeah, I'm right now more of an informal educator, but uh, and a mother, so <laughs> I have that experience with preschoolers. So yeah, happy to be here. And and Kate was the one who suggested our topic this week. Um, pardon the weird noises in the background. Kate was the one who suggested our topic this week, um, which is nature journaling activities with preschoolers. Um, so um, I'm not sure how many folks have had experience with that so far, um, but, but, um, but we're thinking that we'll start out by breaking up into breakout rooms so that folks can, can talk a bit about it. Um, we can talk about maybe experiences we might have already had, or if um, we haven't, then maybe questions we have about how to do it. Um, and then we'll reconvene and we'll get to go through all of that. Um, so welcome back to our main room. Um, before we continue with our main discussion, I hope everybody had a wonderful um, conversation so far. Um, and so, uh, I'd like to invite folks to please write down in the chat um, what you talked about in your breakout rooms, any activities specifically um, that you might have that you might have discussed, um, and also any questions. Um, and then after folks have a chance to write that in, then then um, then Kate Ryder will read it out, and then we can move into questions and big group discussion. Um, does that sound does that sound agreeable to everybody? Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing a thumbs up. Excellent. So. I'll just give folks a moment to type into the chat anything anything really good that you would want to share in the big group. All right, we have using pictures in thought bu bubbles for it reminds me of um, using the first sounds of words or letters if they are not writing yet. I'd like to add to is just even doing little scribbles <laughs> like all the way down the page to kind of mime, you know, writing. Um, we talked about group journaling with the little ones since they can't write or draw much. Um, oh, that was, you know, we have one, um, one journal that everybody shares. And so if people can write, they can write, um, but the, the leader can model just saying, oh, this is what we saw and this is what we not noticed. Um, scrapbooking leaves, either doing leaf rubbing or just taping uh, or pasting things in. Um, tricks to show distance. Oh, I'd like to hear more about that one um using eyes to, or using eyes to point to what they are noticing how to integrate parents with the group if they are present was a question that i had um, um i wonders out loud or have an adult write them down um we also talked about i didn't this isn't in the chat but we talked about um scavenger hunts are always great you know, I have a leaf like this. Can you go find one? Can go one, two, three, search is the one from, <laughs> is always a great one from, from Jack is, you know, just and send them off to go find something. Um, just practicing observing um, tracks in the ground and just different cycles and, and finding things um, around. And yeah, I think that's, um, oh, getting them to move like animals and plants before they start to draw. Yeah, using using large body movements to help describe um, and to imitate what they're noticing and what they're seeing. Um, yeah, does anyone have anything else? Uh, I'm noticing two things. So number one is, is it Lindy? Lindy wrote something in the chat, which we will get her to share. And Deb in our group had a question um, in our group is that she was wondering, she's uh, teaching art to three-year-olds. There's just her and 20 students. And she's, yeah. <laughs> and she's finding like how to 
um, how does she sort of keep them on track because they're sort of running around and things like that. And so we discussed a few things in our group um, about, you know, moving like animals, having stations kind of set up to move through the stations. Um, Chris had um, an idea as well. And unfortunately, my internet was out and I didn't quite hear everything Chris said. So maybe she could share as well. Um, and so maybe that could be one of our first questions. And then Lindy just had by the looks of it in the chat had an experience. So maybe we can get Lindy to share after that. Does that sort of work for everybody? Yeah. So let's start off with sort of Deb's question. How do we wrangle 23 year olds for art class? Well, for the <laughs> record, I exaggerated. It's 15, but a lot of days, <laughs> but a lot of days I had both classes. So I had an extra person, but then it was 30. Yeah, that's so a lot it was of never kids. 20. Okay. Cause this is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I to hear from you. Your name is Lindy, right? I only know yeah. you by from the wild. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't change my name in here. I don't know why. Um, but I am a former pre-K teacher, longtime pre-K teacher. And um, one thing that I think is really helpful to keep in mind when you are, when you have a, like a large group, especially of younger students, is how and like being really thoughtful about how you present your materials and when you present your materials. Because if you put journals and, you know, markers or crayons or pencils or watercolors out on a table and then gather everyone to that table, you cannot then give instructions. <laughs> it's over. They've got the materials in hand, they're ready to go. So thinking about using the space that you have and setting that up really thoughtfully. So like perhaps you bring them to a grassy area where there's really not much to do except roll around and kind of talk and listen. And that way you have that discussion, okay, like we're going to go to the picnic table now and that's where you're going to pick out your journal or maybe you're making journals or maybe you're, you know, um, adding color to something that you've already created. But thinking about how you are going to give that instruction in a space where they're able to focus on that. Um, and if you have the materials on the table, you can you, it's appropriate for them to start using them right away. So don't put them on the table until you're ready for that to happen. Um, I think is is one kind of good management strategy. I think that's an excellent one. Um, <clears throat> I did was I did a similar thing with with my kiddos as well, um, keeping my things into the backpack right until it was the time to bring them out, and then bringing them out as they needed them, but only after, like you said, after giving the instructions. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. Um, and then and then Chris, um, I remember Billy Joe had said that you that there had been a specific activity that you'd had that you might want to also share. Oh, but I think you might be muted though. There, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I have taught that age group very seldom, but when I did. I broke down um, concepts into little small parts. I presented them on a, a felt board. This was a long time ago in the 60s when everybody used these, but it really was nice because you had just block pieces and the kids could focus just on that. We do that in the classroom. I would teach like, let's go look for overlapping things. And notice that the thing in the background is overlapped by something in the front. And we talk about it, I place them, then we would go outside and look at them in nature and then come back in and draw it or, or something like that, follow, follow along. And yes, those were big classes, but I was not, I was, you know, not in charge of them entirely for the whole time. Um, and I could teach, I taught overlap, intensity, some basic perspective because you could look at uh, lines, you know, uh, lots of things that they could see, and then the idea of how it looks when you go outside, and then how you could draw it on the paper. Um, just things that have high, higher details when they're up close, no details when they're farther away, uh, the intensity of the colors, and we would actually, you know, press harder on things when they're up close, lighter when they're in the back. 
Um, and this was because it was an art class, but also, you know, we use what we have, which is nature. So, but I would give instruction, then walk, then draw. Okay. I never would have thought of that, like have them go out and do an activity and then come back and draw. I am totally stealing that. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. It works. <laughs> it works. Something I can add to is, um, is I would, um, when I would teach the preschoolers, I would always make sure to start out with a very, very physical hands-on activity um, every single time so that that way there was a routine to it. Um, and, and we would have sort of different units. This, this is one of my incomplete lists, but for example, the first week might just simply be welcoming the kiddos to the garden. Um, oh, here, sorry, let me just, let me just do this a little bit better to make it easier for folks to see. Um, removing all spotlights and then, sorry. And then here I am. There I am. Okay. Um, so we'd start out with welcome to the garden. Um, so then that way the kiddos would learn kind of the rules, um, which always meant that because it was a community garden that I was introducing them to, that the rules would be things like um, we can touch, but only very carefully. And it's always better to double check just to make sure um, that it's a safe thing to touch. Um, and so, so we can touch gently. Um, we could never really go inside of another person's plot because the, the only plot we're allowed to go inside of is my own. And it's also the only plot we're allowed to pick things from. So, so rules about respect and boundaries with other people's plots and then to have fun. So I try to keep the rules pretty simple with that. Um, and then we'd walk around and I'd ask the kiddos to, to talk, sit, speak out loud and notice things that they, that they thought were neat or that they had questions about. Or maybe if they were a really quiet group, I might show them a thing to try out. I might say, oh, here, folks, feel this leaf right here. And maybe it'd be a yarrow. And I'd say, what does this feel like to you? And so that way they'd start getting practice using describing words. Um, and, so, and so then um, that might be the first thing would, would be a class with intro and then drawing. And with, when we would have drawing time, I'd have on hand each week a different book that I'll get in a second um, with a different theme, each one. Um, so that then that way, if the kids finish with their drawing early, or if you get a kid who doesn't really want to, then there's still something to help them connect with the theme of the day and reinforce it. Um, so then unit two would be let's plant some seeds because then they would have things to take home. So usually they take that back to their preschool and keep them for a bit, and then hopefully they'd grow or the teacher might allow them to take them home, but once they're out of the garden, it's out of my hands. <laughs> um, then three would be a five senses lab. So I'd get some really safe um, herb leaves. In fact, if you're in my plant class today, a lot of things from Lamy ACA, that family. Um, so then people could rub and smell and, and mm -hmm. use their describing words. Um, worm lab, because that can be kind of fun, have a spray bottle, spray it, and the kids can watch the worms kind of wiggle. And then a, a critter count, which is good if the kids are learning tally marks. They can make tally marks and then they can draw really simple critters. And I would have come up with more, except that this particular year COVID cut in. So I couldn't, mm -hmm. those were a few um, things that we would do. And so by having an activity at the beginning and then a drawing at the end, even if they couldn't, if, even if they really weren't at the point of wanting to draw exactly what happened, then just doing that would get their hand-eye coordination and get them to start moving. It's get them to start associating being outdoors with nature and drawing it. Mm -hmm. So even just laying the groundwork without a specific outcome in mind can be really helpful. Um, and, yeah. and just in my experience, limited experience that it is. Um, does anybody else have any activities or experiences that they'd want to share with their preschoolers or, or do we want to go into some of our questions? Um, oh, go for it, um, go for it, Lindy. Yeah, just one more uh, activity that I've done. I've done it with older kids too, and they love it. Um, and it depends on where you are. So if you're in a place where it's acceptable to gather any natural materials, um, then we've done something called nature's paintbrush where the children find all different textures of things and um, you know, just natural materials, leaves, pine cones, bark, um, feathers, all sorts of things. And then we go back and actually use them to paint. Um, and that really gets them talking a lot about different adjectives and describing words for like how um, those things feel and what kind of texture they make on the paper and making imprints. And so that's also 
a really like low touch way to make a beautiful nature journal page. And mm -hmm. it's also one of those ways, I think we talked a little, I think it was last week about um, those kids who are a little bit resistant because they want to make something perfect. Um, when you're painting with bark, it's not going to look perfect. It's not going to look like any kind of thing. Like it's going to just be what it is. And so it can really like break them out of that kind of rid more rigid thinking about how they want something to look. And I find that like with my more hesitant kids or like my type A kids, once they get into it, like at first they're usually like, no, I don't want to paint with that. I just want a paintbrush. Um, and then once they get into it, they have a lot of fun. So um, that's an activity that I really like as well. I think that's an awesome activity um, to, to kind of let go, like you said, of that perfectionism. Um, we also have a nature journaler in our, um, in our community who does a similar thing, I, but I can't remember which one it is. I just remember learning it from Marley who learned it from somebody else that with even with adults out in the field, she'll bring kind of a bottle of ink and then we'll collect sticks from the ground and draw. Um, so, so works for all ages, I think, <laughs> um, using the found items for nature, which is really fun. Oh, and I'm seeing a really good idea here. Leslie is putting in sidewalk chalk or chunky crayons on cut open brown paper bags work well also. Yep. Um, oh, or Billy Joe is saying, I wonder if they could use lines to describe the way a bird flies or an insect walks or jumps. And then that's already right there getting into just even, even just a little bit getting into this idea of diagrams and diagramming movement. Um, so that's another great technique uh, to use with, with kids. Oh. Yeah, on a similar idea, I saw the idea of using um, chalk to trace the lines of um, ants, like where are the ants going? Um, and then I've also done um, charcoal or chalk on a page to trace shadows because uh, the shadows keep moving, you know, the second the wind blows or anything. Um, and so the sh it's impossible to get the right thing, but kind of just being able to generally uh, capture the idea of a shadow. Um, and there's so many things you can do with found objects if you're not really focused on having a end product you can take home with you. You know, you can just cut up the leaves to practice scissor, um, scissor use, you can, uh, or hole punch, you know, you can paint directly on leaves or bark. Um, we have the palm trees would fall on the big part, like the big bark part, we would have, we'd draw on it with chalk or with paint, um, painting on rocks, you know, all those sort of different textural sort of things um, or drawing in sand and drawing in dirt, um, making prints in sand and dirt. And then you can also bring clay um, with you out, like little like Play-Doh and sticking found objects inside of that or um, making prints into the clay or the, you know, all those sort of um, different using, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> using 3D mandalas or making faces or different designs um, with the different, you know, just stacking rocks, stacking twigs, all these sort of things, paint with mud. Um, made a video about nature, nature paint brushes. Yeah, any sort of land art can be really fun with the younger ones. And that's also, because my question is about like when you have different age groups working, you know, that's like something you can have different age groups really working together on. And if you want it to be more art spaces, if you kind of um, come up with an idea and you go out looking for those specific materials to, to be able to create that idea, and then you can kind of trace the items onto a paper once you've place them on there in some sort of design or to recreate it on another um, another piece of paper. Um, those are all different ideas. Hey, how do you print with mud and print with sand? I didn't understand that. Oh yeah, so you can either with, with mud, I mean, you can just honestly just smear it on the paper and see the different colors, especially if you have different pockets of mud that are a different color. Um, but you can also, um, if you take rocks or your bare feet, <laughs> we, we tend to go barefoot or your hand, is um, just placing that, you know, just smoothing out a section and then placing your hand in it, um, placing your foot in it, placing rocks and, and leaves in it. Um, so it was sand, it's really easy to um, smooth it out and draw in the sand um, with sticks and twigs. And again, with kids who are perfectionists or kids that are still at like large motor skills and aren't, don't have that fine grip yet. Um, that can be really 
nice activity. Just finger, just sticking your fingerprints in there, anything like that, just in creating, creating lines and um, just kind of getting that sense of, of things that I can do, you know, make this sort of change in the land. But you have to be thoughtful about where you're doing it, you know? And so, you know, you have to have a, a location that you, you can do things like that. Um, One thing I really appreciate about the activities that you're mentioning is that is that they're they're tactile and they're interactive, and so then that way instead of seeing nature as something separate, kids are being taught to be in nature, really be in nature, um, instead of just observing it from afar. Um, and I think that that leads to a much richer experience. Like you said, as long as it's a place that's okay to to do that in. Um, so I think yeah, I really like that particular um, aspect of what you're talking about. And oh, um, Billy Joe is saying that Bethan Burton has a really great blog about nature journaling with kids at all ages. Um, it's in the chat, and I'll make sure yeah, that so I put... she did. It... Oh, before yeah, yeah. So she yeah. So last year the the nature journaling the Wild Wonders Teachers Conference, she did like a like a full session on it, and it was awesome. And so she's break broken it down in terms of like where the kids are kind of at, like where to focus. Because with little kids, like maybe the the eye, eye notices, I think, or maybe, no, no, it reminds me of, I think, is maybe a concept that they're not quite sure how to make the connections or whatever. Anyway, she does a great job about sort of breaking down, like, as older kids, they really get into the questions more. And so really going like, oh, yeah, I don't have to do all three every single time, right? So maybe with the little kids, we're focusing more on the you know, the pictures and the numbers and the pictures, you know, like the drawing, but less on the words, except for them being out loud. And then I'm going to go to more words as they get older. And I'm going to take away some of that emphasis on the picture because that's when fear starts to come in. So she does a really great job. And there's like a ton of activities that are under each of those sort of age groups. So I wanted to make sure I put that in the chat and give her a little shout out because it's pretty awesome. Awesome. So are there, are there other um, activities that folks want to mention, other ideas and inspirations? Um, if not to, um, we can also talk about either, um, either logistics or concerns or questions folks might have. We could also talk about um, supplies that you might wanna have on hand. If, if there's any special supplies that you might wanna have specifically with, um, with preschoolers. So Deb just put into the chat a question. So maybe we'll do that one. Does anyone have to sell their program to principals? Anybody um, have that experience? Yeah, because uh, you get like evaluated like, well, you need to have like an objective and the kids need to say this. And how does poking fingers in the mud do this, blah, da, 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 da. You know, I want to see end results. Um, I just did, um, I was part of this STEM symposium that, that has that sort of thing of you have to have this objective and then you have, you know, how, how, what are you going to be your methods for evaluating. And one of the topics that came up was this idea of um, sense of place as an objective. Um, I don't know if your school has um, things like that, where you're like, it's a, it's a connection um, to, you know, where they are and how they exist in relation to, you know, I think with younger kids, it's usually the, it's like your neighborhood, like your family. Um, and so, um, talking about like, oh, you know, I mean, you're poking your fingers in the mud, you're like learning about soil, you're learning. And if it's a arts class, it's learning about color and comparing, you know, how does this Brown look like compared to my Brown of my crayon? Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it is hard because our, <laughs> it, it depends on what your, your objectives are. Um, and, and, but looking at really like all the sort of, if you're allowed to like, look at just kind of a wide range of, you know, looking at the science, looking at the English language arts and just trying to find ones that are as vague as possible so that you can kind of like, sneak your way in. I can talk to you more later. I did this whole session on arts in the schools where it was all about like, how do you create arts lessons that do meet those sort of objectives? Um, I didn't end up needing that when I went to 
I went to a school and I was trying to explain to the teachers what I was doing when I had the kids in the class and they were like, were the kids okay? Was there any sort of problem? Did you have to call the counselor or the principal? No, great, good job. You were successful in your arts lesson that like nobody threw chairs, um, but that was the population that I was working with. Um, so it sounds like your school is, you know, has these higher expectations um, and it's more about just finding ways to kind of layer those different things. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate national next generation science standards are awesome for all of that. Next generation science standards. Okay. Oh yeah, because you can start. Um, I my friend posted one I can share with you. She did like you you create a watershed. So you just like stick clay to show, you know, to make a big mountain and then you pour water down and the water goes down and then you have the water pooling and you can test have the kids testing, you know, how does water go through gravel versus concrete versus you know, packed mud versus sand and those different things. And so you can have different stations where they're just literally just pouring water all over different things, but you're meeting these sort of standards. Um, oh man, I love it. In case you can't tell, I'm all about getting the kids dirty as possible though. So that can be a challenge if they have to go back into the classroom. But the nice thing about younger kids is usually they're required to have a change of clothes on hand when they come to school. Um, but I found it's not the best thing for the environment, but baby wipes are really, really excellent for cleaning up kids um, after you've done kind of a little bit messier activities um, because you can just like grab them right wherever they are and wipe their hands because trying to get them to go line up <laughs> at a sink, then they're like smearing it all over each other and everything while they're waiting in line for the sink and then they don't know how to wash their hands yet. So I find wipes work really, really well. And somebody said hose access. Yes, <laughs> it's a requirement. <laughs> Actually, that that um, that might be a good time. Speaking of of baby wipes and clothing changes, um, what other sorts of supplies um, do people try to keep on hand uh, for preschoolers for preschool aged um, crews? Um, I see books. Um, I have I have some. <laughs> um, these aren't all of them. These are just a few of the ones. So, for example, green was one that I'll read to them occasionally, which is. A lovely book with all sorts of different kinds of greens so this one might be khaki green and as you can see they do the thing where there's the hole in the page which is kind of fun for the kids they like these kinds of books um, or jungle green and then so then you can sort of see um, within each of them just kind of the creative layouts pea green and so then it's a good way of sort of thinking about different shades of green and how we describe it. So that's a good one for describing words. It's one I sort of use as a filler in case I don't have a specific book for the theme of the week or in case I read one book and then I need a backup book. It's always good to have more than one book. Um, one I like to begin class with because we often begin class in the autumn is A is for autumn. So then um, you can go through and you can say, you know, A is for autumn, A is for apples. And yeah, you get the idea. But then you can also make it sort of interactive. Um, so for example, let's see here, where's I? Oh yeah, here we go. Then I might ask um, the kiddos to say what their favorite kind of ice cream is. Um, and, um, and then sometimes the kids will get excited and say, hey, that's the first letter of my name. And so then you sort of get the kids to, um, yeah, it can be fun in an interactive way or a similar one with spring. Um, or one of our favorites is compost stew that I like to read every time we do the worms. Um, so that the, it's not quite as gross. Plus a fun thing about kids' books is that a lot of them will have really, really different art styles in each book. Um, so it's a great way to introduce kids to a huge variety of different ways um, of, of just capturing the world. Um, so yeah, books, wanted to also say that one. I'm seeing, I'm sorry, my chat did that. I'm seeing a bucket and rags that you can wash later. Yep. Um, another one I like to do are just in case we don't have a place to sit down, I'll always bring clipboards. Um, and we, um, at the time when I did this, we hadn't yet begun making a regular journal, although I think that making a regular journal is probably a great way to go. Um, but instead, 
goodness. Oh yeah, here it is. Instead, what I would do is because these are preschoolers, I would use instead kind of heavy duty paper um, that's a bit thicker. So that, that way it could take some drawing um, a bit more of use, I guess you could say. Um, and so sometimes the kids, like I said, like you saw, some of the times the kids would have a bit more trouble um, drawing things. Although I found that tally marks really works well if you're having them do tally marks, then they can get some really good data on the page. Um, but I'd have a bit thicker paper. I'd have either crayons or pencils. So some writing utensils are good on hand. Um, there's also these kinds of, um, one second. There's also really, really lightweight, soft blankets. And so these can be good if the kids want to sit on the ground and you're worried about them being uncomfortable or things being a bit pokey. Like if you're sitting on mulch and the mulch kind of is a bit sharp, then you can put down some, some um, blankets for the kids to sit on and they're nice and lightweight. So those are a few other ideas. Um, I'm also seeing, yeah, Leslie's got some really, really good ideas in here about cardboard, large paper, brown paper bags, sidewalk chalk. Um, and then Billy Joe is saying sit upon. What, what are some other ideas? And does anybody want to, um, what are some other supplies that you carry on hand? Oh, and of course, like probably a little first aid kit is good just in case you get kids who need a Band-Aid for something. Um, oh, um, I have a little bell um, that I can ring to gather everyone together. And that's like a fun practice too is, uh, you know, I've only done it, I haven't done it with the little ones, but I do notice that, you know, a whistle can be so loud and especially little ones can, can be very sensitive with their hearing and they're like, oh, it's too loud. So, you know, something like that, um, that is a gentle, gentle way to call them back. Um, uh, Elizabeth Kelly says weaving, yarn, a frame, they can weave in grasses, leaves, et cetera. Oh, that's a fun one. And then that you can also like sell it to your principal as group work. <laughs> they all have to, you know, coordinate and plan and discuss, you know, you know, and have kind of their own areas and, how that all works. Um, Viewfinders made out of cardstock to help focus on the area they're looking at. Yeah, I've also seen them called frames and they, they make some really fun ones that I've seen. Um, and they can, you can also make ones where you have um, different labels too. And you kind of are like, oh, you know, this look for this with this frame and you can, you know, it's a way to do a scavenger hunt or um, egg cartons too, to gather different things and put it in egg cartons. We use a crow or duck call to gather or the sound of chicky, chickadee. Man, life goals. I need to be able to successfully. Oh, you've got one. I love it. Um. <laughs> and then when it comes to frames too, if you don't have one on hand, you can also just teach them to make one by by yeah. You can you can just teach them the easy field frame. <laughs> <laughs> and then on that note, I also, I'll bring, um, I have uh, note cards and my daughter really liked drawing on note cards when she was little because it's such a smaller area. It's not sometimes as intimidating as a big area and they're hard. So you can kind of hold just a couple and you don't have to have it be, and then you can kind of just go through them, but you can also put that on a paper um, and then like tape it into your notebook when you're, when you're done, when you go back and using paint chips to compare colors. You can get the, the paint chips, like the strips of the different shades of colors. Um, and then um, you can like, it's not great, but you can laminate them. And then if it's raining or a little bit, they don't get all trashed. But you can just like get them from Home Depot for free. And then you can be like, here's a couple different shades of green, a couple different shades of brown. And then the kids have to go and try to match those colors. So that's a really great way to go along with um, uh, Avea's book is to like read the book here's the activity and then we're going to draw using some of those colors so it's like boom 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 you got three activities that are sort of you know two one listening one running one doing um which can work really really well as well i also see um large handheld magnifiers on there yeah that's another great one is to just wander <laughs> and, and look up really close at things um has anybody else experienced kids getting a little frustrated with getting magnifiers to work? Because there's kind of a point where it's fuzzy and then you get. I 
I think I have oh. had that. Yeah. Oh. I also have experienced that a little bit. And sometimes like the really cheap magnifiers, they get really scratched up, especially if you're working with little ones. Um, yeah, they are easier than binoculars though. Um, but I find that they just love like having them to hold and you can't really help them getting scratched up when you have a bunch of kiddos. So there's not much to be done about that. We also make um, my monoculars with um, paper towel rolls, half of a paper towel roll. So it just helps to focus. They just cover their eye and hold it up. And that just is, sometimes we call them focusers. Yeah, we've done that with paper before where you just like cut a hole into paper. And I don't know if that's kind of what you meant with the frames a little bit, but like that can be really helpful. Um, you could like draw something below, like, or the kids can draw something below that they're gonna look for, like a bird, and then they hold it up and like try to um, zero in on what they're noticing. I think you might be muted, Billy Joe. Okay. Has anyone ever seen these books? There's a series of them. They're called Looking Closely. This is Looking Closely Through the Forest. And so when you open it up, hold on a second, it gives you like, here it is, the picture, right? And then it gives you some like looking closely, like, so what do you think it is? What could it be? And then when you flip it, you get the kids to like, oh, I think it is, you know, la, 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 la. And then once they guess, they have to flip it over and they see that it's a bunch of leaves and then it gives you some information. So when you're talking about like zooming in, things like that, these ones here work really, really well to be like, what is it? And the kids come up with all these like really cool ideas. And sometimes you can get them to be like, what does it remind you of? And kind of come up with their own little hints and then to flip the page and go from that. So there's one for like the ocean and the pond. And I think there's like eight to 10 different books in that series. Um, and they're really fun uh, to sort of work with, especially if you're thinking like, you know, you want to get them to sort of draw in a different way. Like maybe you're taking it to the next level, the next class or the next few classes or whatever. That's a really fun book. I wanted to tell everybody about it. Who is it? Oh, it is. I'll put the title up there. There is the person right there who is the author of the book, which is awesome. All right. Oh, thanks, Avea. Does anyone have anything else or any other questions about things that they are sort of wondering? Look at us, nature journaling this whole thing. What are we wondering? <laughs> <laughs> does anybody ever do like a group whiteboard or paper thing where where you have the big thing and then and, and then you have kiddos um ask their questions and then um you can either write describing words or draw little um little easy drawings about uh, just kind of like a, a group brainstorm of ideas around a certain topic out in, in nature I've had teachers do that like after a nature journaling session um, and then they use those questions to create like inquiry projects because especially like I'm not sure how um, kindergarten or preschool works in the states but in Canada they changed our curriculum completely so it's not like they learn math they learn language or anything like that it's it's more about sort of uh, play based and there's sort of four overarching concepts that they kind of go for so it's really like what the kids are interested in and the teacher can kind of go for that and then implement language and math sort of into that but I know that some some of them have been like have questions like why is the sky blue and then they go out and they observe the sky and they do all these different things and then there's some inquiry into it and they start check checking the temperatures and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, or like what are snails and why do snails do this and then they sort of do an inquiry project and so they sort of brain our, our mind map or sort of you know brainstorm all these different concepts as a group and then you know pull different pieces of that apart which as a teacher or facilitator that makes your job kind of easy because the kids kind of designed it and now all you have to do is like facilitate it which is pretty awesome so those are a couple ideas too 
That sounds like the Regio. I, I don't know how to say it. Like the Reg, Reggio mentality. What is it? The um, Reggio Emilia. I'm saying that one terribly wrong. Um, but I, yeah, there, there. <laughs> some people have it in the chat. Um, so this was a book that I had picked up from um, the library bookstore. And it is, it's, kind, it's all about that. And it just has all these wonderful pictures with um, student questions. Um, and so they, they are investigating shadows in this entire book. And it's, you know, they, the, the students have questions of how can I, um, you know, what's happening and where does my shadow go? And, um, you know, and it has all these images. And this is a great thing to share too, probably with, a, with if not that you have any chance to take photos, um, but if you did happen to have a chance to take photos as um, a proof of learning, because you can really tell that these students are like very carefully investigating and wondering um, about what's happening with shadows in this different, in the book. Um, and they have a lot more emphasis on art. So they have, um, oh, and that was the thing too, is that having a um, themselves as characters in it. So not just this abstract, I'm drawing a plant or the cycles of a plant, but this is me holding a flower. This is me in it. And this was, so this book is full of all these images of these little of kids and them um, examining their own shadows um, and seeing what happens. But there was this whole section, it was really cute, where they <laughs> mapped the shadow along the wall and they had the students come up with different ways of what do you think is going on here? And they said, oh, we gotta keep the shadow from, from leaving. And so they put tape around it to try to keep it from going. And oh no, it escaped anyway. And just these really interesting um, ways of investigating um, that wouldn't, aren't necessarily documented. I mean, some of them, you know, they have all the little kid drawings, but um, so that's one way of documenting, but it's also just that that student-led inquiry. Um, but yeah, so, and that was, so that was kind of my question is that when um, I have had parents, because for, for me having, I, I have studied a little bit of child development when, you know, when my daughter was little, you know, whatever she drew is however she drew it. And if her person had 20 fingers, you know, the person has 20 fingers and you don't worry about it. But I see a lot of parents and I see a lot of teachers and educators going, oh, no, 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 you, you know, people only how many fingers, you know, and they really focus on that when the student is trying to draw like a little drawing of, you know, a little kid, you know, like, oh, I went swimming in the ocean and I loved it. And, <laughs> you know, it's not what is the goal here of what you're trying to demonstrate um, or what the student is really interested in. Um, and I think what's nice about these is it's the, the, this, this kind of approach is that it's more, this is what the student is studying and they're using these images to help describe or explain or, or kind of work through a problem um, rather than the picture as the end goal, um, which has just been like a whole journey for me to change my mindset as well. Um, Billy Joe says, uh, the goal I think at this age is fun and exploratory, being creative and using their imagination. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and I think that <laughs> brings up another thing that I've noticed now that um, going through again, seeing younger kids is how much they love the pretend play and how much, you know, you're like, oh, we're going to go outside and we're going to do this. And then suddenly it's, oh, but here's my little, you know, here's these caves. Oh, let's talk about these caves and let's investigate these little holes in the rock. And why do you think they got there? And she's like, no, this is my kitchen. <laughs> and I am making soup right now. Like they're not holes in a rock. This is not a cave. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is my kitchen. And I'm using this right now as my kitchen. Um, sorry, I'm all over the place this morning. Um, but I just love this topic and it's really inspiring me to want to work with little ones again. I use a wonder tree in my classroom where students write their wonders down on leaves. Oh, that sounds beautiful. I want to go in your classroom so bad. Um, using the senses, which bird sings like this, a cardinal, a blackbird. Yes. Yeah, using all of those senses and, and then finding a way to record it. Either you're doing it or they are or yeah, some combination. Sounds. I wonder if they could try to recreate the bird sounds like um, like Elizabeth is saying, like there's lots of really great apps and you could, you know, sort of um, listen to it and then can they recreate it? And then like, if you're looking for like how to create curriculum into this then get them to create their own bird song with 
the sounds that they've come up with and as a class create like some kind of chaotic like bird orchestra right and so now they're using like tempos and beats and you know all these different things based on these sounds that they've heard and then you know can they go out you know what happens when we go out to the yard and we do our bird orchestra do any birds call back like it would be total chaos in the kindergarten would go crazy for it i think that would be so fun i think i'm gonna have to try it next time i have kindergarten next year well i'm thinking even like a storytelling and then you have the evil scarecrow Yes, and just get them to make up stories. Lindy was mentioning last week that she does a lot of fairy gardens with her kids. Like she creates these incredible communities um, with her fairy gardens. It's like, imagine maybe if now you're adding birds into your fairy gardens and it was like this whole epic community. And then they were sort of drawing and sort of, you know, creating these like story tapes or even like these sort of comics about what's happening in their sort of fairy world. Oh my gosh, like the end, like the possibilities would be endless of like what the imagination can sort of come up with in this land that, you know, you're already encouraging them to sort of create, right? And then you're adding these little like bits and pieces. Oh, that would be so fun. This is also the age of pop-ups and kids love their pop-up books. So if they don't already see the magic, then you can put in, hey, so who wants to, <laughs> who wants to find all of the fairies hiding in the forest? And then you can get them to kind of go and enjoy some pop-ups with certain, yeah. And you can do this with like, there's bird ones that you can do, um, but it's a really wonderful book. Um, I mean, sorry, it's a really wonderful age to really enjoy the magic of pop-ups. Um, so just wanted to just remind people about, about pop-ups because you mentioned um, fairies. Fairies and berries. <laughs> um, and then another thing I like about pop-ups is that pop-ups are made to be looked inside of. They're made to get closer. And so it's a good way of also reminding them to do the same thing with actual nature. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, ooh. Once once you saw a heron catch a fish and swallow, yeah, it's it's good to enjoy those moments. And like you said, with the um with the comics too, then you can try to figure out how to write in the story, um, or you can create it so that they do the drawings, and then you can write down if 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 they're at an age where it's hard to write, then you can also be the one who writes down the captions. Um, so like for example, and, oh. sorry, I was just gonna say like also with comics. You don't really need a lot of words like maybe it's just a like, oh, wow a bing a zang a zap you know things like that and so their little drawings are actually telling story like a picture book right and but you've given them these each little square to sort of tell that and you've asked them to use one sort of you know crazy sort of word that sort of says like jump zap and then they're adding those sort of in there oh that's really fun yeah anyway so sorry and then also it's good if, if they don't already have a, like even actually, no, I take that back. Whether it's you're doing this on loose paper or whether it's in their journal, it's also good to make sure that the kids either have or that you help post the date um, because then that way you can see how they grow. So the kid might've done this um, and then you put down exactly what, what if there was a lesson that day, then you put down what the lesson was. Even if they're, they're, what they wrote had nothing to do exactly with the lesson, then at least it kind of keeps, it helps them keep track of, of what they were learning each time and how they were growing. Um, so I wanted to add that too, um, as a thought. Uh, I'm, loving, I'm loving all of these ideas. Yeah, because that's a good, because I've, I've noticed that when um, with journals is kids don't always necessarily understand like front to back. And so I just remember when my daughter would grab my journal, she'd just pick it open whatever page she was on and she would start drawing in it. And so I imagine if you start giving your kids their own journals, they're going to do the same thing. And so, yeah, making sure that date's in there. And so you're going to have be like, this one's in January and then this one's in November. And <laughs> yeah. And for curriculum ties, we are now teaching the days of the week, the months of the year and the numbers. Right? So if you're looking for that like connection, it's it's all there, right? So that's the nice thing about all those things that we think are like, oh, the date, this is what we're doing for this, but it it adds in all those math pieces, right? Which is pretty awesome. 
the weather icons. What does it look like outside? Is it sunny out? Is it cloudy? Is it sunny with clouds? You know, all these different kinds of things. Is it snowing? Is it raining? And then getting them to draw, even practice those little weather icons. Um, now they're looking at seasonal changes. Ding, ding, that's part of the curriculum in Canada. <laughs> so you can get all those things sort of in there. I've also been noticing that Lindy's been putting some really good ideas into the chat. Do you mind if I bring you in to share a couple of those, Lindy? that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, when I was a, a pre-K teacher, we used journals really heavily. That's actually how I got into journaling in the first place. And I was uh, often doing garden science with them. So um, at first our journals were something that we used in the classroom. And later I kind of made the connection that we could be bringing them outside and doing all these wonderful generative things with them. Um, but with journals, because they're young kids, one of the things that was a big time saver for myself and helpful for them, because you're right, they will just flip to any random page um, and start, but I wanted it to be kind of a record and I used it for assessment purposes as well to look at, you know, their writing development and their letter formation over time and their character development and things like that. And so one of the things that we started doing at the beginning of the year was we would make bookmarks. And now in outdoor education, we make nature bookmarks as one of the first things that we do. And they write their name at the very top. And so they stick that, they can, I mean, it takes some practice and routine to do it, but they stick that on the page when they finish. And for me, as a classroom teacher, storing them, I stored all of the journals upright so I actually could see the names at the top of their bookmark. And if I was pulling a small group of students, I could really easily say, okay, this I need like JoJo's and Josiah's and this person and then like just grab their bookmarks. And I mean, their um, journals really easily. So that saved me time. And then they also knew to open it. It was really easy for them to open to the next page um, and start that. So that's a kind of helpful hint. If you have a laminator handy, <laughs> that's also probably necessary if you wanted them to last. Um, but that is that is one way to do it. Excellent. I love that. Plus, then that's a great way of just having access. Yeah, like you said, to, to the kids' names, just write them in there too. Yeah. Um, I'm also seeing a question here from Mary, from Mary Ellen about with the next generation science standards, do you plan activities first and then look for connections to NGSS, or do you start with NGSS and then go from there? I don't have as much experience with NGSS, honestly. I'm that's kind of a growth point for me. Does anybody else um, have any with the NGSS that they might want to share? Um, yeah, I have, I have some experience with that. So I usually start with my activity um, because I find that NGSS especially, and as well as like the core content standards, they're really, they cover everything, <laughs> they really do. So think about the activity that you want to do with students. So let's say it's um, sound mapping, and then think about the actual skills that it takes to do sound mapping. So they're using their five senses, they're practicing some, um, some identification of sounds, they might be using discussion later on to identify those things. They may be writing it or diagramming it. So think about all of those separate skills and then go into NGSS and give it a quick read. And you kind of look at those like overall, um, I think they have like the cross cutting concepts, but then they also have um, domains that are more specific. So look at the grade levels that you're working with and then any domains that kind of pull at you. So you might see like some five senses work and you say, okay, like it's probably in there. So then go in there, look at what they have written down and then try to um, grab the NGSS standards out of that. So I would go with your activity first. However, caveat to all of this, like don't do any of that work. That work is already done for you. So don't reinvent the wheel. If you look at like John Muir Law's like nature journaling for educator books and things, like he has core content standards and NGSS connections in there already laid out. 
And it's very likely that an activity that you're doing is similar, at least in skill set, to one that's already in there, even if it's not the same exact activity. Um, and then also, I am trying to create like a little bit of a, a guide for educators as well, because I do some educator training. So I can, when that's done, like next year, I'll share it with this group. Um, but like there are educators who have done that work already and pulled out those standards to apply to a lot of the activities that we've been talking about. So I would just do a little digging before you go crazy, like trying to find each standard. Um, I, would, I would look at some of those resources first. Um, in fact, I will um, briefly, I will point um, some of them out. You might, I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks already have this, um, but just because sometimes it can be a lot just to, so here are a few um, that might be kind of good. He includes in here the cross-cutting concepts um, in the book. So we have, you know, patterns, cause and effect, all of these, et cetera. Um, that would be page 90 of his book. Um, so, so that, the, the one that he and Emily Ligren wrote together. Um, so then we also have our or who, what, when, where, how, and why. Um, we have the international baccalaureate key concepts in here, if that's if that's helpful to folks, similar to NGSS, but slightly different. So that's here in page 92. Um, and then some of the best materials you can find here in his appendices. Um, and so if you want specific connections on um, the NGSS um, connections, then what they have, what he has are, the activities um, that are within the, that are within this book here, because there's a lot of really great activities, and then about where they connect with things. So, so just so people know where to find this information um, inside of the book, um, two sixty nine. Um, also, um, we recently received a request in email that um, that I post up the NGSS video that we did pre previously in an educator's forum because I've been remiss, and so that one will be posted up very soon as well. Um, so I'll make sure that that is. Um, is available to people soon because we have we have a workshop that we did in the past where we went really really in depth um, into it. So I'll try to get that one up as soon as I possibly can. Um, so oh, and and one more thing is like no matter what you're doing, it's going to align with some of the like practices of science that are named under NGSS. So make sure you just like check out that page real quick. I think there's like 15 or something like that. But you are going to be able to align if you are observing questioning, you know, like connecting to science concepts, they 100% align with the practices of science um, standards um, under NGSS. So um, you're definitely hitting some of those. So definitely include those. Thank you. Um, are there any other thoughts or big topics that we should go over um, before we conclude for today? I want to make sure that there's nothing um, I overlooked or that we're missing. If not, then I wanna make sure we also get to do a quick announcement with our events coming up. Um, Y'all ready to hear about some events? Okay, cool. Um, um, in case folks are wondering, Jack should probably be back in the first week in August. Um, so just a couple more weeks to go before Jack returns and is with us again. Um, but we've been really, Billy Joe and I have been really happy to be here with you and just have this time with you this summer. So thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, thank you for all of the work and all of the light you bring into your students' lives. And, and just, just teaching nature journaling itself to anybody is an act of stewardship. So props to you for your stewardship. Um, thank you to Kate Ryder for helping us to, to lead today's um, topic and for giving us the topic and for, and for your youth program. Major props to you, Kate Chandler. I'm looking forward to your event on Sunday. Um, and thank you to everybody, um, everybody here. And thank you, Billy Joe. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everyone. Have an amazing week, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.